Well, hi there. My name is Dave Detman. I'd like to invite you to today's video. Today we're teaching a class called From Trust to Trust, the A to Z of New Construction. What we're going to do here is we're going to show you how to work with people, both investors and users, in other words, regular buyers, and how to take them from looking for a used house or a fixer-upper over to new construction and get them into buying new construction because for investors the return is better there's less headaches and for buyers they're getting a brand new house with everything under warranty how could you beat that but a lot of people don't understand how to work with that because they're afraid of new construction only because they don't understand it so for the next couple of hours we're going to take you through every phase of new construction everything you need as both an investor and a real estate agent to be able to market and sell new construction so come with me now because it's going to be kind of fun. We're going to spend a little over an hour doing a little slideshow presentation. Then we're going to get in the car and go look at a couple of brand new homes in different phases of construction so we can see with our own eyes what it looks like. This will be a great video. I hope you come along and have a good time with us. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for being on time this morning. Uh, we are at a special presentation. This is the first time we've ever presented this. This is called From Trust to Trust or the A to Z of new construction. I'm Dave Denton, I'll be your host today. It's going to be an interesting class, we've never done this before. We're going to spend about 45 minutes to an hour going over the important parts and phases of new construction. Then we're going to go on a field trip. We've got a friend of ours that I've been doing business with, we're building a couple houses with, and he's going to come in. His name is Philip Sarna, and he's going to take us around. We're going to look at three or four of his houses, and then there's a couple other ones that we're putting up so that you can see all the different phases of the construction so the goal of today is that by the end of today, you'll have a very firm footing and understanding of new construction, what it is, how to present it to buyers, how to sell it, how to build it, and also how to present it to investors, and how you make money, both working with investors, working as an investor to build one yourself, and also as a realtor to sell it to end users. Uh, it's been my opinion that most agents have no idea of new construction. They really don't know what new construction is. I mean. They understand it's a house, but most, most real estate agents, what they do is they immediately, when they find a buyer, will go out and start selling a used house, where in fact, if they would take the time to learn new construction, you'll find that a vast number of buyers you work with will buy new construction. So from an investor standpoint, it makes sense to build new construction. And from a realtor standpoint, it makes sense to tell people about new construction. So we're going to give us some very simple dialogue on how to convert buyers into new construction. And uh, by the end of today, you're going to be experts. How's that sound? All right. So what I, for those of you who've been with me before, I usually try to start the day off with a joke. So I try to think of a new construction joke. And it's the closest I could come. In, in my book that I wrote um, called The Funny Thing Happened, which is my new joke book that just came out two months ago, uh, I tell a story, of, I, I have a whole chapter called the Duh Corporation, like Duh, all right? And it's where all the idiots work, all right? Because there's always one company in town, no matter where you are, that you go, oh man, don't go there, they're all, they're all idiots. You mean realties from, all, from outside, not, not I, real estate. And, and I don't want to say real estate, I just use company in general, but you make your own, you know, ideas. Um, but uh, I took all these jokes and I put them into something called the Duh Corporation. So it goes like this. Um, there's two duh employees and they decide to help out building a house and habitat for humanity, which is something that we all do, it's a good thing. And they're up on the roof um, nailing shingles up. And the one guy watches his buddy and about every third or fourth nail his buddy pulls out of the uh, uh, bat bag, he throws it over his shoulder. He pulls one out, pounds it, pulls another one out, pounds it, pulls it out, looks at it, throws it over his shoulder. This goes on for about 20 minutes and he finally goes, what are you doing? He goes, well, some of these nails are defective. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, the head's on the wrong side. <laughs> so I throw it over my shoulder. He goes, you idiot. Those are for the other side of the house. <laughs> so, so there are some people that just don't get it. All right? and that's why we're here, to make sure that you all get it. So from trust to trust, the A to Z of new construction. For those of you that arrived late, there's room in here. We've got seating for you if you want to come in. Uh, in this course, you will learn the following. Understand the difference between a good lot and a bad one. Permitting, impact fees, assessments, and other costs involved. 
Important questions asked before selecting a builder. You just pull that chair right over there. Yeah, pull that chair right in. Financing your new build. Contracts and draw schedules. Common pitfalls, understanding and acquiring timely lien releases. Understanding the building process, terms, time, and trouble. Inspections, county and private. Builder's warranty, what does it cover and for how long? Total OOP, out of pocket cost, base, extras, upgrades, etc. And we're going to talk about areas to be careful in on this. Marketing and reselling the home, if that's your plan. Some of us want to build it for an end user. Some of us want to build a model home to build more, sell more homes off of it. Uh, but a lot of us want to build it to resell it, so we'll talk about that. How to get started and what ROI can your investor expect? If you work with an investor, they're all about ROI. What's ROI stand for? Return on investment. Return on investment, exactly right. You guys are a smart group. I like that. And then we're going to go on a field trip. Let's go look at some new houses. Um, our friend Phil Cerna just came in. Everybody say hi to Phil. Hello. And a matter of fact, I should have started this right away because not everybody knows everybody. So why don't we go start this out of the table and tell us your name and if you're out of the Cape office or the Fort Myers office and or if you're a guest. So. Charlene Trudell, Cape Coral. Ivania Momoro, Fort Myers. Valerie Dobbs, Fort Myers. Karen Osso, uh, guest. <laughs> I am Monica Danley. I am here located Fort Myers. Todd Blascon, Fort Myers. Byron Lopez, here in uh, Fort Myers. Wesley Joseph, Miami, Florida, yes. Francis Riska, Miami, Florida, I guess. Thank you very much. And Philip Sir. And I'm Dave Detman. <laughs> okay. So, how to sell a buyer on building new instead of buying old? Well, part of what I did, I, this goes back a lot of years for me because um, I actually was flown out by my old company going back about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, they flew me out to San Diego to learn the art of new construction because it was an area that we were just getting into. And I spent two days learning how to sell new construction to people that had never bought new construction before. So if I could take the whole two days and boil it down to a single slide, this is that single slide. This is the secret. Okay, now there's a lot to remember here. So you might want to write this down. How to sell a buyer and building new instead of buying old? Ask them. <laughs> okay. If you literally just ask them, would you consider buying a new home? You'll be amazed at the answer. Matter of fact, the statistic looks like this. 50% of buyers will answer yes. yes to the question, would you consider buying a new home? Now that's an amazing statistic. What's interesting about this is how many buyers are we all working with at any given time? How many? Oh. How many buyers at any given time? Three to three to five. Well, three statistics to five, three are three to five, five buyers, five, yeah, right? Five. So we've got at least seven or eight realtors in here. So that means we have at least 30 to 40 buyers in this room. They're not with us, but that's about it, right? Mm -hmm. That means 15 to 20 buyers would buy a brand new house today if you simply ask them. That's all you have to do is ask them. Uh, but realtors make the mistake of immediately going to the multiple listing service, mm -hmm. running through it, and finding houses for them. Oh, you're looking for a 322 on the southeast side. Let's see what's over there. Never thinking, hey, wait a minute. Would you consider buying a new house? So my challenge to you is the next time you're sitting with a buyer, stop and go, excuse me, would you consider buying a new house? Remember, would it help you guys if I gave you some dialogue? Yes. It would? Okay, let's throw some dialogue up on the screen. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, since we'll be looking at a few properties together, may I ask you a question? Would you consider a brand new home? If you're going to write anything down, this would be the time to write it down. Okay, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, since we'll be looking at a few properties together, may I ask you a question? And then, would you consider a brand new home? If they say yes, what should you do? Well, are we talking end user or are we talking about end user? Loan? This is end oh, user. End user. Oh, end user. user. Mm -hmm. A very small part of today's presentation is going to be about investor. A very large part of the presentation is going to be about what new housing is. But we're going to balance out with how to sell it to both end users and investors both because they're both important. So when working with a general buyer, ask if they want to buy, build a new home. If they'd ever consider a brand new home. 50% say yes. What do you do? What do you say if they say yes? 
But I have two that want to get a construction loan and build, but not as an investor. They want to live in it. Well, that's what we're here about. Okay. And so those people, you already know that. What about the people you don't know that about? I ask every one of my buyers. Okay, every and what do you do if they say yes? I bring them in here and sit them down and talk about it. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and for the rest of you, your answer is, I don't know. The seminar just started. Would you give me three hours, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's how that's going to work. So I've taken his other classes. That's how I know that. <laughs> don't buy land just to buy land. Mm -hmm. All right. Everything starts with a lot. Everything starts with land. Where, where does it start? You have to have something to build up, right? Now, we're in the state of Florida. What is Florida known for? Going way, way back... Way, way back. The Everglades. Uh, well, kind of, but swamp. from a real swamp. estate, I heard the word swamp. swamp Have anybody ever heard about the old scams of buying swampland? Mm -hmm. hey, this goes way, way back. Hey, I went down and bought a bunch of land in Florida. Yeah, some guy, was he was, he, he was telling me about these great deals in Florida where I should buy some land. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and about land, they, they, you hear the stories about them coming down here and finding out they bought swampland in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Well, those, those stories are based in truth. So I did some digging around the internet and I found this short uh, one and a half minute video of a guy um, being sold swampland in Florida. So let's take a look. I've come down to Florida to pick out my swampland. Pretty excited about this because this is primo property. Meeting up with this guy. He says there's never been a better time to buy than right now. So how many acres did you want? We've got about 25 acres around here. You can have the view, the water. Yeah, I'm just thinking like 10 acres. 10 acres? Well, look, look if, if we can close it out today, I'll throw in an extra five. Alright, so that makes it 30 all together. 30 acres. 30 total acres? Yeah. And what's the uh, price on that? Uh, I think we're going for, I think 150, 200. Yeah, how about 140? Uh, I don't know, about 140, maybe one. 199. It's a. Uh, what does it mean when it's a preserving? Is that? Oh, uh, preserve is just a fancy word for lots of lots and lots of room. So yeah. So we got we got all together. We got about 140,000. Tell you what. Tell you what. If, you, if, if you could throw in that boat, that float boat out there, I I can sign to that. Got to talk to the missus about that one. to start off the morning and yeah there are or were unscrupulous people that sold swampland in Florida uh, now today obviously we're buying lots but there's still a lot of ways to lose money on a lot that's not, not necessarily lose money but there's a lot of things to know about buying the lots that's really where it begins so I'm gonna give you some very basic stuff about information about lots and how to tell a good lot from a bad lot so understand the difference between a good lot any bad one. Very simple. High is good. Okay? I'm going to make the, one thing you'll, if you've been with me before, you know that I speak in very simple terms. I make it very easy to understand. I'm not going to give you like tons of dialogue. I try to make it very, very simple, like first grade learning is what I call it. So if you're taking notes, high is good. All right. I'm standing on the road. I'm looking upwards at my lot. By the way, this particular here is a lot that I bought from Phil back there. All right. So if you're standing on the road and you're looking up at the, you, you, what you do is you find the crest of the lot, where the lot crests off. And if your head is going upwards at all, it's good lot, all right? Pretty Just right. the opposite is, if you're looking down at all, it's bad. So low is bad. Where do you stand? Well, you stand in the middle of the road, okay? And as a rule of thumb, Roads are kind of concave, okay? Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're circular on the top, that's so water runs off. So from where the crest of your road is to your lot, mm -hmm. if you can draw a straight line, if it's below the crest of the road, you will be adding fill. If it's even with the road, you're gonna add fill, but less fill. And if it's high like this, in some cases, they actually have to remove dirt, but that's rare in Florida. Florida is not known as the land of hills. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah that's true. Okay, all right. So, but regardless where you buy it? Regardless where you buy it, I mean, there is an elevation that's required in order to build. Okay. You have to receive an elevation certificate to figure out, uh, when, they, when they survey the land, mm -hmm. they will tell you if you're surveying it for new construction, how much fill is required to build on that lot. 
right? And this is very important. Okay. What does fill cost? Well, what it fill is dirt. dirt. Okay, we're gonna bring in dirt, just to be clear about that. And what's it cost? Well, sometimes three to four thousand dollars worth of fill is gonna do it. It's how many truckloads of fill they actually bring in a dump truck and dump fill in there. And sometimes less and sometimes more. This particular lot, we don't have to do anything with. But this one here, as you can see how much lower it is than the house on each side, is gonna require an awful lot of fill. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot down in Bonita Springs right now that we're building on. We bought it knowing it was gonna need a lot of fill. It was low like this, but it was in a primo area. And that's why nobody had bought it, but we got it for a really good price. We're gonna spend around $12,000 in fill. fill. Mm -hmm. That adds to the base cost of, of building the house. So you wanna know that going in. A great question before ever buying a lot, when you think about building, is getting your builder out there to stand on the lot with you and say, what do you think of this lot? And they're gonna tell you that. Now, that's what we're covering here this morning is some of the base things to know so you don't chase them out there for everything. But essentially, high is good, low is bad. Could your offer be contingent upon the survey? Your offer is always contingent upon a survey. Essentially, it is called a feasibility study. That is the Thank you for asking that question because I did not put that in any of the slides. So you want to write down the word feasibility study. All offers for vacant land will include a feasibility study. And that's to make sure that it's buildable. Right. Now, second, clear is good. It's a nice clear lot. Okay. Trees are bad. But Dave, trees are pretty. I like trees. Okay, well, here's the trouble. It costs money to remove these trees. The more trees, the more money. Now, if you have a very large lot and a lot of trees at the back, and you want to keep some for shade and, and, and possibly you know, aesthetics, great. Talk to your builder about that. But a builder will tell you that the more foliage there is on the lot, the more money it's going to cost to prep that lot to build on. So, clear is good, trees are pretty, but they can cost money. Approximately how much to clear a lot? Approximately how much to clear a lot. Phil, how much to clear a lot? There's no standard price. It's um, depending on the... It, it's all variable, and I kind of go, I'll touch base on it a little bit. How much per tree you tried there? It doesn't. That tree could be a certain type of tree, and we don't know. My general contractor told no, you know, the trees, but there'll be bulbs under some of these types of trees that will dig up all that fill dirt, and it could cost just like a specific tree, it could cost you three grand just to, because of the bulb, will take up all that fill dirt and you gotta backfill it. Can, you, can okay. you take a photo of the lot and send it to the builder and ask him? I'll go, I'll go over this, but yeah. we'll essentially go out and assess it for you. Yeah. There's multiple. Yeah. Dave's touching just on a few items. I'm going to touch more on like exactly like what oh, will happen. Oh, you're, gonna, yeah. you're part of Correct. the... Yeah, yeah, oh. Phil's, yeah, 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 the, the Phil's going to get up when I'm done and, and, and touch on this a little oh. more detail. Yeah, it wasn't technically I'm, late. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know who you yeah. were. I just yeah. thought you were another guest. Uh, <laughs> uh, Phil works with Groff Construction. Oh, you're with Groff. Oh, yeah. okay, All right. Okay, cool. so, so essentially, these are kind of keeping it very simple. Clear is good. Trees are bad. I can start getting this prepped tomorrow to build it. Next, nice looking neighbors are good. You look at your lot, you see, look around, and you look at some nice houses around the area, great. You look across the street, and you see an ugly looking neighbor. Uh, yeah. Maybe not. I like this picture. These are actual photos I took when I was out walking lots. And I looked across the street, and I'm pretty sure that guy is growing a lawn on top of his roof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. So I realized, okay, if I'm going to build here, I'm going to stand out here, I'm going to go like this across the lot, because that's what somebody's going to see from either the front side or rear porch or window. And if I'm going to look at something ugly, that means my buyer's going to look at something ugly. So be aware of your surroundings when going out and walking lots. So nice looking neighbors, good. Ugly looking neighbors, bad. Other things to consider. Freshwater canals, boating, and how much? Well, in Cape Coral in particular, there's a ton of freshwater canals. When I first moved here to show you how naive I was, and I knew new construction. I came from Wisconsin, okay? So to me, you know, Florida was the land of water. I love to boat. 
you know, we got a lot of lakes in Wisconsin. I couldn't wait to get a place with boating. Um, I bought a house on the Gulf Access Canal and we keep our boats there, which is great. But when I first moved here, I'm like, I thought any waterway was a canal. So I remember immediately going, wow, look at Lehigh Acres, it's filled with canals. Mm -hmm. I found out real quickly, those aren't canals, those are drainage ditches, okay? <laughs> I can put a boat in a drainage ditch. Um, but Cape Coral is filled with canals. There's over 400 miles of canals in Cape Coral. Half of them are Gulf Access canals, half are freshwater canals. Wherever you live, there are areas that probably have canals. Uh, you want to take a look at those canals. First of all, are they navigable? In other words, are they boatable? Some freshwater canals in Cape Coral, let me use this as an example, um, go nowhere. I bought a house, because we do a lot of house, we've done a lot of house flipping over the last uh, seven, eight years. We've been party to over 1,500 buys and flips. And uh, I bought a house once because I walked behind it. I saw a beautiful seawall with a beautiful freshwater canal, lily pads, fish jump, and I thought, great, this is super, it's waterfront. I found out after I bought it that the canal stopped exactly where I saw both ends of it. All it was was about 300 yards of canal, and that was it. It just was a little tiny nothing canal um, that had a big impact on the value of that canal versus some other canals can go for miles, all right? And some canals are actually connected to several different lakes. Uh, we're building on a lot right now that's part of a seven lake chain in Cape Coral where you can boat all day long. So the amount of boating that you can do has an impact on the value of that canal and how much boating you can do has an impact on that canal. So if you are looking at building on a freshwater canal, take a good look at the canal and figure out if it's boatable and how much boating you can do because that will add to the value of the canal. One of the nice things that we currently have in our area is that the freshwater canal prices have not really jumped. Okay, Gulf Access, which is next, Gulf Access Canal boating and how far, also has an impact on that. But to stick on point here for a second, your standard lot, a, a dirt lot, just non-off-water -off lot, is going to run you between twenty and twenty-five thousand on city water and sewer to build. Uh, you can find non-city water and sewer lots, which we'll talk about in a second, for eight to $12,000. But if it's on city water and sewer, you can be between twenty and twenty-five, up to thirty-five or forty, depending on your view. But essentially, that's about where they are. The waterfront freshwater lots run twenty-five to thirty, to maybe thirty-five. For, so for a couple thousand dollars more, you can have water in your backyard. All right. So something to be aware of is, you know, there might be some very, very good deals on freshwater canals because waterfront is worth more than non-waterfront. This, this is a rule of thumb that's always true. Then there's Gulf Access. Gulf Access means you can put a boat in your backyard and navigate out to the Gulf of Mexico. And like I said, there's about 200 miles of those types of canals in Cape Coral. Fort Myers has them. A lot of cities in Florida have Gulf Access canals. This adds a tremendous amount of value. It takes a um, $25,000 freshwater lot up to a $100,000 and higher uh, value of lot because it's Gulf Access. There are still some Gulf Access lots in Cape Coral priced in the mid to upper 30s as your base prices. But the distance to the Gulf, yes they're boating, but how far wow. out? The distance you have to navigate to get out to bigger water has a huge impact on the price and the value of the lot. So for instance some of our lots you can buy, you can put a, you can navigate out to the river in three to five minutes, but those lots are selling for 250 and up. Uh, versus you can get a lot that's going to take you an hour, and this is putt putt really slow, na 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 na, but you're getting out to the lot, and you're getting older and your beard's growing while you're waiting to get to the big water. Uh, those are the ones you can pick up for 30 to 40 thousand because it takes an hour to get out. And it's not just an hour to get out. That means when you're done boating, it takes an hour to get back home again. So just something to be aware of. However, we've bought a couple of lots like that ourselves because we got them for the same price as a dry lot. So navigable is a lot better. So just be aware of golf axes versus freshwater, the boating, how much and how far it has a lot to do with the value on those lots. Seawalls, yes or no on the cost? Well, if it is a golf access lot, a seawall is required. Freshwater. Okay. Period. On freshwater, it's my understanding that not all freshwater is required. I have seen lots of that. Have they changed that? Yeah. 
They have. Are they all required now? Because it used to be that you didn't have to have a seawall in fresh water. Yeah, you can't even build on it. Well, okay, so they passed that now? Mm -hmm. Okay, well then, all right. You can do so that river rock, or uh, the, 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 the coral rock? You can yeah, still do it. Like on Pine Island, they do a lot of just coral very, rock. Uh, they highly suggest you don't, though, because it only lasts for a few years. Okay, so, all right. And it's not that much cheaper, so. All right. So seawalls, what's a seawall cost? Well, it depends on how big your lot is, okay? Um, your standard lot is going to be uh, 80 by 120. Uh, so you got 80 feet of seawall in the back. An 80 foot seawall today is running around $11,000, in case you're wondering. Uh, and if you want to add a concrete dock on top of that, that'll add a couple thousand dollars, maybe about 2,500 onto your cost. So about 11,000 uh, without a dock and about 13,500 with the dock rough figures okay these also have to be installed by specific companies because they have to work with the dnr and and the, the permits and everything to put a seawall in and just something to be aware of also every once in a while save the whales comes around or save the turtles or save the mosquitoes i don't know what the hell they're trying to save these days but every once in a while somebody steps up and tries to save something and that can slow down permitting when dealing with waterfront property we've seen that it kind of comes and goes in waves, but specifically when trying to put in docks and stuff, this can have an impact on that. So just keep that in mind. Always work with your builder on doing these types of things. I'm gonna jump in real quick, just sure, real quick ahead. to write down for, as part of, if you write an offer on it, put, get a seawall quote as part of your due diligence mm -hmm. or your, uh, um, I can't think, you know. Your feasibility. Feasibility study because, yep. and here's why. They'll go out and they'll give you a price quote but certain, and we're starting to see it more northwest, you're gonna hit mangroves. And some people will have certain types of mangroves and you know, some are, you can rectify, some you can't. So yeah. you need that definitely in your feasibility study. To get the, you can just call up any of the Honk or Williamson and Sons and they'll go out there and they'll tell you exactly what's out there and how much it'll cost and then hopefully they don't see anything. But it's very key in your feasibility study to have that done. Yeah. What's the name of them again? Well, there's um, a few different yeah, places. Yeah, Honk. We use Honk or Williamson and Sons. Williamson. Yeah, you can. There's a couple other ones, but it's always good, obviously, to get a couple quotes. And every town has its own two or three people that work that. You 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 don't have a hundred different people that work those areas. There's usually in every township just two or three basic companies that do that kind of stuff. So, um, city water and sewer and assessments. Well, there's city water and sewer. Uh, we all know what that is. But there's also areas that just have city water and no sewer. Uh, for instance, Cape Coral, the south half of Cape Coral is all city water and sewer. However, you go down to Bonita Springs, there's a lot, a lot of areas in Bonita Springs that have city water but septic. So you're paying for the water but you're still installing your own septic field. And then when you get like, to the outskirts areas, most of Lehigh, the north part of Cape Coral, and anything outside of a city is going to be all well and septic. And what does that cost? Well, City water and sewer. Uh, I'll let Phil talk about those costs when he gets up. And assessments are the actual cost of that, that gets paid over time. So give or take a $20,000 assessment uh, when city water and sewer gets assessed against a lot that's been installed in Cape Coral uh, is usually set up on a 20 year payment plan. So the person sees about $1,200 a year because there's, in, there's interest on that on their tax bill. So. Uh, it's set up over 20 years of they own it for five years and they sell the property There's 15 years of unpaid assessments that go with the property and that transfers on to the new buyer and becomes part of their tax bill So one of the things is a realtor you want to be aware of when selling property that is on city water and sewer that has assessments You don't want to scare them into thinking. Oh my god. There's eighteen thousand dollars in unpaid Assessments I have to pay that no you want to explain that that is assumable and that becomes part of the tax bill because you want them to assume that. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while you will get a buyer that just doesn't get it and they just demand that they get paid. Well, that's just not feasible with a lot of the new construction because builders have a certain profit margin built into their building, which is very low. Builders don't make what you think they make. I'll let Phil cover that in a second, but keep in mind that you, know, you see a builder building a $300,000 house and they go, oh man, that guy's making 60, 70 grand they wish okay they wish they were making that kind of money no they make money on volume it's a very very low percentage so you want to explain to your buyers that that they they should assume those unpaid assessments 
well and septic. What's the cost about well and septic in? Well, all that fill cover that cost too, but basically it, it, it varies a little bit from area to area, uh, but for the most part, uh, between your well and your septic, 12,000 bucks is a good rule of thumb because uh, your septic is usually six or seven, and your well can be another three to 5,000 depending on the depth, and you don't know until you start dr drilling what the depth of that well is gonna be. Yes. Now, eventually, uh, the handles that have septic, eventually, maybe they'll get to run into assessments? And Thank you for asking. That's mm -hmm. exactly true. Mm -hmm. Some areas that have well and septic can be subject to expansion projects for the city water and sewer, where all of a sudden, next year, the year after that, the year after that, they could have city water and sewer coming through and get whacked with the hookup and the assessment. That's the Northeast. Yeah, and northeast and northwest Cape Coral right. will be city water Thanks and sewer people. someday. Two seventeen, they're getting. Yeah. Two thousand seventeen, yeah. northeast got us. Uh, is yeah. getting assessed. The, the 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 big city plan is that the whole city will be city water and sewer, whereas Lehigh, a uh, uh, five percent, ten percent of Lehigh is city water and sewer. The rest will always be well and septic. Mm -hmm. um, so just be aware of these things when you're looking at building in an area. Uh, check with your county and ask if there's any expansion plans for that area for city water and sewer before going and throwing in a uh, septic system and building a new house because you would hate to put in something with those costs only to have it ripped up a year later because assessments are coming through. Flood zones and wetlands, things to be aware of. You visit your flood maps. Go to Google and Google flood maps for your area and take a look. There are different flood zones. There's different elevations, okay? And depending on the flood zone classification, you may require zero flood insurance. You may require $300 a year flood insurance. You may require $1,500 a year flood insurance. It really depends on the location that you're in. Those people that are tearing down the old houses down in the Yacht Club area of Cape Coral, that's one of the most desirable areas there is. People love that area. They're tearing down the 1960s built two bedroom houses and building 4,000 square foot mansions. But that area down there is the lowest part of Cape Coral. So even after bringing in fill, it's still subject to flood insurance of twelve dollars to $1,500 a year. Uh, but it's a beautiful area to live. And versus other parts of Cape Coral, a little bit further up, don't require any flood insurance. So check your flood maps and be aware of that. Wetlands, here's another neat little thing. Florida has a lot of wetlands. That's why that funny little clip earlier. And can you buy and build on a wetland? The answer is yes and no. Okay. Um, a very good friend of me and Phil's um, bought an area down in Bonita. Uh, one, I think it was a one and a quarter acre down in Bonita uh, a couple of years ago, only to find out that it's mostly wetlands and he's going to have a very hard time building on it. He got a really good price on it. What you actually essentially do to build on a wetland is you destroy a part of the wetland because you, you have to bring in fill in order to make it buildable. For every square foot of wetland you destroy, you have to create wetland somewhere else. Oh, so that, that is the rule with building on wetlands. I'm oversimplifying it. I could talk for an hour on it. But if you're going to build on wetland, whatever you're going to destroy, you have to create somewhere else. Now, just imagine the cost on that. Why would anybody buy a wetland? Location. How to create a wetland? I can talk for an hour. <laughs> what do you do? Just dig a big hole and just fill it with water? Yeah. You have to take area that's not wetland and create wetland. All right. I think so. you just, you just answer is don't do it. Yeah. 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 So Basically, <laughs> don't do it. It's could, exactly you build, right. could you build on stilts or something? Yeah. Build up? Now, sometimes wetland is obvious, like in our video. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you walk out there and the naked eye, it looks dry. One of the giveaway points on wetland is the type of trees that are growing on it. Oh, interesting. Okay? Mm -hmm. Florida has different types of trees. If you see tree with bark that's really wet, papery, spongy bark... Wetland. Wetland, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, a lot of the golf courses installed those types of trees to suck the water out of the ground. So just be aware of that. So I guess the bottom line is if it's a wetland, hey, don't build on it. Don't buy it. Go find something else. It's cheaper and easier and faster. Burrowing owls. A little something mm. that we have down here in Florida. Can you build on a lot with burrowing owls? No. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The yeah. answer is yes and no. Okay. Um, some of you say yes, some of you say no. Burrowing owls are protected. Cute little guys. Mm. We have some right across the street from our house. And uh, 
you can relocate burrowing owls when they are not in mating season, okay? But only during that season. And you have to relocate them just like you're creating a wetland, you have to create a new haven for the burrowing owl, and then you can. Because uh, in our neighborhood, the burrowing owls that live there are living on a $250,000 golf access lot. <laughs> Okay. But you Somebody's can't going to relocate those owls someday. But you can't do it. You have to have somebody do it for you. You have to have somebody do it for you. Yeah, you, uh, if, you, if you're out there with a shovel <laughs> with relocating owls... You might go to jail, first of all. <laughs> yeah, you might go to jail. Yeah, don't, don't do that. So you have but to just, pay somebody to, to do yes. Yeah, just yeah. be aware that there's something called burrowing owls, and, and if you see them, you're not going to be moving them, but it is not an end-all, okay? Uh, north, south, east, west... Wait, 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 you didn't talk about the burrowing turtles. Oh, I'm sorry. No, up, in, up in North Florida, for those of you who don't know, Alcala is filled with something called Oh, they're here in Cape Coral. I've seen them. Well, they are a couple here, but they're yeah. predominant up in, up, in, okay. up there, okay? Where you actually see splotches of sand everywhere. Right. And they have burrowing turtles there. You're right. That's another problem. That's another. But you can. Uh, the city told me that you can yourself go move those turtles to no, somebody. Don't no, do yeah, don't, don't do <laughs> that. Yeah, don't do that. Can't do that. We're building don't, right don't now. Do it's, they're they predominant like really in Bonita, actually, in the oh, Cerro. Yes. Uh -oh. Like we, Cape Coral's mostly got burrowing owls. Yeah. They got. It, it's a mound that's about this big. Yeah. You have to dig yeah. them. You have to hire a company to come in. Oh, you hire a company. Okay, I'll just know like for that shovel. I've been to Cape Lots here with I know they're there. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. They take over the burrowing owls. I, I, I don't know. Oh, all the city. Do. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah. Just there. something to be aware of. Yeah. Okay. North, south, east, or west exposure. Well, first of all, what's exposure? The backyard. If I'm going to expose myself. Not you. <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> um, okay. A lot is rectangular. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. You're going to build on that lot. When I'm talking about exposure, am I talking about the way the front of the house faces no. or the way the back of the house faces? Back. Back. It's the way the back of the house mm -hmm. faces. That's exposure. So when somebody says this has western exposure of beautiful sunsets, you're talking about the back of the house. Mm -hmm. Now, which is best? South. Well, it depends. The Europeans okay. love You say south. south. Okay. Mm -hmm. who, who, who here thinks south is best? Absolutely. Okay. Who here south thinks best. north is best? One person. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, you, probably, you probably own a house with your own exposure. <laughs> that I can sell. <laughs> <laughs> Who here thinks east exposure is best? Right. Who here thinks west is best? West is second best. All right. right. Now, I'm going to tell you my opinion. Now, everybody has an opinion, um, and mine's based on fact. First of all, your north and south exposures are considered your best exposures. May I explain why? Okay. Because when building, a lot of people in Florida have an amenity they add into their house. Do you know what it is? Oh, Not just a little pool. Lanai, a pool. pool. Exactly right. They build a swimming pool. All right. Now, if you have a northern or southern exposure, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Mm -hmm. The sun is shining on that pool all yeah. day long with northern and southern. You have more sun on your pool with a southern exposure than you do with a northern exposure depending on the size of your lanai and how far out you build the pool from your lanai. Because if you have a northern exposure, there's some shadowing on your pool, but you still have sun on your pool all day long, which down here, people want to swim in their pools. Um, and uh, the, the more sun you have on the pool, that's going to keep it warm, right? More, more of the year, and also for solar. Your eastern and western exposures East exposure is sun in the pool in the morning up until about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, depending on the time of year. Your western exposure pools don't get sun on the pool until probably around 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, and then the sun sets. Now, western exposure is considered the worst, by, as far as I'm concerned, because of the fact that uh, what happens is the sun sets. What's the, what, what is the sun at, at night as it's setting? If you're sitting there with the sun beating on you. Mm -hmm. It is hot. Yep. Okay? All right. So, you see, oh, watch the beautiful western sunsets. Well, the problem is if you're sitting in your lanai, as that sun's setting, you can't sit in your lanai. A lot of people will tell you it's really hard to sit in the lanai during a sunset because it's just that hot sun beating in on you. Okay? So, it's my opinion that south is number one, north is number two, east is number three, and west is number four in terms of exposure.
I have to pause this for a second. He's looking for a key. I didn't want to interrupt the pick up the tape. All right. I can uh, honestly the um, from what we, when we build south and west is the is the most. That's what I've yeah, heard. Because the I most the of, Europeans and, you, and I'll give you a little bit of tidbit of information so on Cape Coral because it's based yeah. on a, Cape Coral design like on the grid. Okay. The last date <coughs> in the address of the lot, so if it's 2014 southwest, whatever, the last digit will dictate the exposure. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. If it's an even say, number. Say, say that again. It was about the last digit dictating the exposure. Kind of, I was just kind of, when we build, a lot of people want southern or western exposure because right. they like the sunsets, they yeah. like those whatever. So, but Cape Coral is designed on a grid. So what they did, and it's probably like 99.9% .9 of the time, I've seen like one case where this didn't happen, but you can dictate the exposure by the last digit of the address. So if it's 2014 Southwest 31st, you go by the four. But the even numbers are south or western exposure. The odd numbers are north or eastern exposure. Wow. So even number cool. are west? Or even numbers south or west. Odd numbers north or south? North or or east. Or north, very north. Excellent. Cool. Multifamily or single family is the next little spot I want to bring up here. Uh, when going out and looking at lots, if you want to build a single family home and you find that you're in an area with all kinds of duplexes, is that a good idea to build a single family home in that area? Probably not, okay, unless you're gonna live there and you like it, or you're gonna use it as a rental property. Um, there are areas that are designated duplex lots and there are areas that are designated residential. When the township sets their township up, they will have zoning restrictions and they're gonna try to restrict the multifamilies to one area and the single families to another. This is not universally true, which is why sometimes you drive through a town and you see, you know, a, an ugly house next to a beautiful house, next to a duplex, next to a shack, and you're like, okay, there's no zoning in that town. Versus Cape Coral is very big on zoning and how they do things. So you, this is why you want to pay close attention to zoning. But when looking around, if you look around, you see a bunch of duplexes, you're probably in a duplex zoned area. Uh, if you're looking around single family, you see a bunch of single families, you're probably just single family, but double check that with, 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 the, Cape, with the county official with Cape. Cape Coral will be a main road, a Santa Barbara skyline, you can build duplexes on. And you can go a block off of that. You can't go any deeper than that with a duplex. Mm -hmm. So if, you, yeah. if you're like a block off and you don't see a lot of duplexes, be careful because they can build them tomorrow. They can start building a duplex right. block off and you have one across the street from you. Yeah, so just something to be aware of. Um, parks, schools, and shopping. Parks, schools, and shopping. How far are you from parks, schools, and shopping? This is going to play into when you go to resell that property. People when buying houses, they want to know where the parks are, where the schools are, where the shoppings are. Um, you know, these are just things to be aware of. So one of the negatives with building in the upper upper part of Northwest Cape Coral, you got a Northwest address, but uh, you're so far away from anything that you got to drive 15 minutes just to get somewhere. Uh, so this has an impact on resale, and that's why those lots are so cheap. The closer you are to amenities like this, the higher the cost, but it's more desirable. Distance to the beach. This is something that tends to be an important factor here. I laugh when I see distance to the beach. Okay, because almost everybody that comes here wants to go, okay, I'm looking at this house or this area, how far is it to the beach? Meaning, in our area, Fort Myers Beach. Now, I've been here 10 years. My first year living here, I went to the beach a lot. <laughs> I don't think I've been to the beach in eight years. And I live 17 minutes from the beach, okay? Why? I work, okay, I work for a living. Uh, I'm down here doing stuff, I've got other things I do. So, the beach is kind of like for vacationers. And uh, so, so it is an important thing to people that are moving here for the first time. So be aware of that and know the distance to your beaches. For you guys in Miami, you know, that's going to be something that they're going to be curious about too. But the funny part is after they live there for a year or two, they'll probably never go to the beach again. Just mm -hmm. something that we've learned. Uh, financing. Okay, on lots. Is there financing on lots? Can you go to the bank and take out a loan for a lot? Yeah. The answer is yes and no. 
giving you a lot of ambiguous answers, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is it yes and no? If you want to buy just a lot, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Banks are not financing lots right now. Because the market crashed and the banks got stuck with thousands of lots that they financed, and the problem is is that they have a $120,000 mortgage against a lot that's worth $15,000. It's a bad place for the banks to be. But they will finance a lot if it comes with a house. So what you do is you get a new construction package, house and lot, they're going to finance those two things together. Right? So just be aware of that. Other than that, you're pretty much paying cash for the lot. Or seller financing. Or seller financing. And, and, I'm, and I'm all for seller financing. Matter of fact, one of the nice creative things I like to see is maybe find a seller that's sitting on a lot, you agree on a price on that lot, and you say, listen, I'll go into business with you, I'll build a house on your lot, and when that house sells, you'll get X number of dollars for your lot. That's less money out of your pocket. You have to have the right kind of contract so that basically both of you guys are going to go on title, otherwise you're not going to be able to get a loan, all right? But these are creative ways of financing and building a house to save you some money where at the end, the end, re, the end result is the same to you because you're looking for a profit because that lot is just a cost anyways. You know who would probably be really open to that is if the lot's owned by an investor. If the lot's owned by an investor. Yeah. Or, and, and, and don't be surprised that people aren't willing to take a huge loss on a lot. Um, I told this story a couple of times where when I was working at another real estate company earlier a few years ago, the market crashed and a guy came to me and said, I want to list my lot. And I said, well, um, what'd you pay for it? He said, well, I paid 88,000 bucks for it. Now, what's it worth? I looked it up. It was worth about 8,500, <laughs> okay? And I said, listen, I can get you about 8,500 and I'm gonna charge you a 10% commission because I'm not gonna screw around unless I make at least 800 bucks. He thought about it for five seconds and said, list it. Mm -hmm. And we listed it and sold it a couple weeks later and he got his 7,700 or whatever it was and off he went losing, you know, 80 grand. But he was happy to lose 80 because at least he got something. Don't be surprised if some people want to do the same thing. So, but but definitely think about that where you try to go into business with the person who owns the lot and say, hey, I'll, I'll give you your price, but I want to build on it and sell. Because it, it is a way of making things work. Uh, what else can we talk about? Well, a whole bunch of stuff, so let's keep moving. Permitting, <laughs> impact, <laughs> fees, assessments, and other costs involved. Okay, permitting fees are included in the standard builder's contract. I'm going to have Phil talk about permitting fees in a couple of minutes. But permitting fees are usually in your standards builder, standard builder's contract as part of the quote that the builder is going to give you. Impact fees change from township to township. Impact fees are not permitting fees. It's another fee. Yes, the township is going to get rich off of you building. That is their job. Okay. But what, what, what is a, a general or, or, or an English version for impact fee? Uh, money in their pockets. Mm -hmm. That's it? That's no, pretty you, much it. You the, pay them for the, permission the, to dig in your own lot, and, right? See, here's, here's the idea behind the impact fee. Okay. I've got 100,000 people living in this, in, in, this, in this town. Okay. One more person comes in and builds that's impacting our town. Uh, that's going to require me to hire another policeman. I'm going to have to hire another fireman. Uh, okay. I'm going to have to build another park. That's I'm going to have to build another school. I'm going to have to hire more uh, teachers. And you impact the entire uh, gotcha. town. Uh, okay. So okay? That's the impact. okay. So they've calculated this out to a number, because everything's money, <laughs> as to you want to build, it costs you this because it's going to cost us this. I'm uh, oversimplifying okay. it, but oh, no, that's basically what it comes that's, down. That's what I Is that in the builder package too, or paid separate? It depends on where you're going to build, and Phil is going to give you some of those costs in a couple of minutes. Do you pay before? Or? And, and, oh, and impact fees are paid at the time of, of your permit. Okay. Permit. Okay. Um, assessments also change from township to township. I mentioned assessments already, mm -hmm. but I just got stuck with a big assessment down in Bonita because the lot that we bought was in foreclosure. The previous owner had paid some, but then lost the thing. So I had to pay the balance in order for me to get my permit. Uh, so I had to shell out $9,000 yesterday for me to get my permit. So you know, every township's different. So you want to check all these fees out because obviously all this stuff impacts your bottom line. Yes. But where, when did your, uh that fee came in after you bought Well, actually, after. the thing is we're in foreclosures since 2006. Oh, okay. okay. This is 2016, so it took a while. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So things to be aware of. 
Uh, many assessments are assumable, as I mentioned a minute ago. So if the assessments are assumable, get your buyer to assume them. If you get, if, when selling the house, so every once in a while you get in a position where that buyer is just not going to pay the assessment. Okay, look at your bottom line, and if you've been sitting on it a while, maybe you've, you pay the assessment just to move it. That happened with one of our houses just recently. You do whatever your bottom line tells you to do, but try to get the buyer to assume the assessment. Other costs? Um, again, when Phil talks, if there's any other cost based on this. Important questions to ask before selecting your builder. These are great questions. This is a combination of questions as to whether you're building for an end user or you're a real estate agent interviewing the builder to see if maybe you can get them to start working with you and maybe you can pick up a listing. Every real estate agent, if they go out and talk to a lot of builders, mm -hmm. will find that builders want to use real estate agents to sell their property mm -hmm. because builders don't have the time to chase around looking for buyers, especially that builder is building spec homes. Um, now, the bigger builders have their own real estate company, but a lot of your small time builders are happy to work with realtors. You'll find this out because a builder wants to build. A builder does not want to market. Why does a builder want to build would be a great question. What's a builder win? Why does it ask me why a builder wants to build? Well, because why does a builder, builder want wants to want to build? Why does a builder think? I'm still glad you asked. <laughs> okay. A builder wants to build because they like to see the work of their hands. They want to do something that gives them gratification. When a builder builds a house, they get gratification because they did something with their hands that was special. They built something out of nothing, and they like to stand back and go, I did that. There's pride. Did I do that? That's a good thing. All right? That's what you want. And we want builders to do that. We want them to have that feeling. We, as realtors, market property. So let the builder do what makes them happy, but they, and many of them, will work with us to have it sell so that they can do it again. So let's take a look at some good questions to ask a builder. Are you a licensed builder? I would say that's the number one. Okay. Are you a licensed builder? If the answer is no, stop, move on, go find somebody else. Would they have something like, like we do over there? They would have a license. A uh, license right there. Yes. Yeah, correct. Well, a Absolutely. license Sorry. contract. Right? Contract, okay. Yeah. Licensed builder, licensed contract. Yeah. How long have you been in business? Great answer to, to a great question to ask. Well, we just started last week. Um, okay, next. <laughs> All right. How many homes have you built? Is a great question. How many homes have you built? You find out your builder has been building for 25 years. They weathered the storm of the crash, mm -hmm. and they've been involved in over a thousand new builds. Mm -hmm. That's a very good resume. Um, they built one home before the crash, and they came back another building their second home. Maybe not somebody you want to get into bed with, okay? Mm -hmm. Get in bed business with. <laughs> bed with business with whatever. We're not getting in bed with. Right. Uh, what price range do you build in is a great question. What price range do you normally build in? You'll find that a lot of builders build in a particular price range. Mm -hmm. D.R. Horton builds primarily in a lower end price range. Lennar builds in a mid to higher end price range. Mm -hmm. Right. Different builders build in different price ranges. It's important to find that out. What areas do you build in? Some builders will build only in Cape Coral and not, not, not in other areas. Some builders will build in Cape Coral and in the area of sewer and water, but they won't go where there's well and septic. A lot of builders won't go where there's well and septic, and some, some builders that build well and septic won't go build where there's city water and sewer. Find out what areas that they build in. How many homes do you build a year? Not just how many homes have you built, but how many homes do you build a year? It's a great question. What's a good answer? A good answer? More than one. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Um, what are your plans for the future? If the builder has actually had thought about plans for the future, that's a good sign. If they really haven't thought much about the future, that's a bad sign. They should be able to give you some kind of answer, say, well, our plans are this, and we want to go over to here, and we're going to start building here, or we're going to open an office here by here. And, you know, if they have a plan for the future, it's a very good sign. Mm -hmm. Have you used real estate agents in the past? Great question. Followed up by how often? Now, this is obviously for the realtor. This is not for the end user. So I've mixed some of these questions together. Okay? And what was your experience is a great follow-up question to that. Well, I, you know, and, and see what they have to say. And if they had a bad experience with a realtor, find out why, find out what that realtor did, 
and ask, listen, if, I, if, you, if we could show you a better experience, would you consider using a real estate agent again? It would be a good follow-up to that. What do you think today's buyers are looking for? And this is a real estate agent question. And you want to get this feedback. I learn a ton every time I talk to a builder because builders go to seminars about new construction. We go to seminars about how to sell houses, but we never go to a seminar about new construction. Builders go to seminars to, speak, to hear speakers who are other builders working in other parts of the country to find out new ideas so they can go, hey, that's a cool idea. I want to bring that to my area, and I want to do that. These are great things you want to know. Uh, who does your subcontracting is a question. Some won't tell you. Some will. But you basically, it's a question that you want to ask. It's a great question as a real estate agent to ask. Um, do you have home indemnity insurance? I'll let Phil talk about what that means in a second, but that's a great question. Are there any current or past billing disputes underway with the relevant building commission in your state? Now, it's, yeah, you're being checked out. Are you, are you in court over anything? Is a great question. Yes, Byron. Is there uh, like... Uh like we have uh, public records that we can go and check that builder? If it, if it is an actual uh, ongoing dispute and there's a court case filed, once it's filed it is given a filing number and yes, you can check that out. Okay. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Oh, no, he goes go so fast. He can't as fast as I'm he sorry, I do go a little fast. I apologize. I'll leave that up for you. that DR Horton Express is proud of their work. When I show their houses, it's embarrassing. They sell them, but I, there's I always an entry-level buyer. Mm -hmm. I personally am not interested in entry-level homes. You can't make money on an entry-level home unless you're building a hundred of them. They're all cookie cutter. Yep. The ones I show, they always okay. have all kinds of problems. Everybody got this? Mm -hmm. Okay. The front door doesn't All right, so moving on to the next one. <laughs> Some more questions. Have you ever been declared bankrupt? Great question. Okay. If the answer is no, I mean, a great answer is, hey, we were in business before the crash. We're still in business. We never went bankrupt. That's a good answer. That is a fantastic a answer. answer. Absolutely. All right. Have you had a, a different yeah. name before? Yeah, you had a different <laughs> name. <laughs> there are. There are builders that went bankrupt and came back under another, another name. name. Yeah. These are things to be aware of. Mm -hmm. What is your warranty? How long will the building maintenance period last? Now, those are, those are actually two questions. Okay? Most builders will tell you we give you a one-year warranty. Okay? Building maintenance is, hey, how long are you going to come back and fix stuff for me after I move in, after, after we sell it? And you might get two answers with that. I think in the state of Florida, you have to have a one-year, the builder has to have one-year warranty. Think so? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, who supervises the property construction? Most of them are going to be able to give you a snap answer. Hey, you know, we've got a supervisor there on site every couple of days, every day. I go and look at it myself. You know, these are great questions. What about your trade base and its long-term employment? This has to do with their subs. Hey, you know, do you have subs that are fly-by-night? You go to the labor pool and get them and you don't have any future for them? Or do you actually have a well-laid-out plan and you, you, you're planning on long-term term employment? A good answer with subs is, hey, we pay our subs every Friday we, and, and they know that, that they're going to get paid every Friday, and that's why they'll never leave us. Because as building grows, other building companies will come and try to steal subs from a job site. Happens all the time. You get a bunch of good people working for you, all of a sudden some foreman pulls up and goes, hey, what are you guys getting paid? Uh, 22 bucks an hour? Come on me, it's 25 bucks an hour. And they drop their tools and go, okay. And, somebody, and, and the builder goes there and goes, where's everybody? And somebody stole your crew. <laughs> It just, it, it happens, it's part of the business. Can we view your recently finished products? Projects, excuse me. Product, project, same thing. Um, obviously, the answer should be yes. Hopefully, everybody has something that they've built that you can go over and take a look at. Even if the people have moved in, most builders will have a relationship with the person that moved into the house where they can go over and, and walk a future prospect through so that they can see what, what was built. Um, what other projects will you be involved with while working on my house? 
great question. In other words, are you too busy for me is kind of like the question. They want to know that you, you, want, you want to find out whether you're an investor or an end user, hey, are you going to be able to start and finish my house? Or are you working on a bunch of other stuff? Now, have you ever saw that uh, honesty commercial? But it shows a contractor come in and he goes, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to rip everything out of your kitchen and then we're going to leave for a month and you'll never find us, so don't even try. But when we get done, you're going to love it. And it says brutal honesty. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Um, you know, ask them what they're doing. Ask them what they're involved in. How long does it take to build a house? You're going to get different answers from everybody. Oh, we can build it in four months. Beware of that answer. Okay? They're trying to buy your business with time. Mm -hmm. Very rarely can anybody build a house in four months. Permitting alone can take three to six weeks. Okay? Um, <clears throat> my first building project, from start to finish, took 14 months. I was not happy about that. However, my next few projects are all exactly on schedule, right? Because there was a learning curve. So ask them how long it takes to build a house, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to ask for proof that they can prove it. What guarantees can you make me to bring the job in on time? You will rarely, if ever, have a builder sign a contract for less than a year. They're almost always going to, they'll tell you, I can get it done in six months but they're going to sign a year contract. And you say, well, why is it a year? You told me you get done in six months. I'll let Phil talk about that because there are all kinds of things that can jump that can in the way and screw up a build right? that are not the builder's fault. So they have to protect themselves. Do you give discounts for multiple builds? Ask. Never hurts to ask. And find out you know, you know, how many are you thinking about building? And how many projects can you comfortably handle at one time? This is a great question. Uh, some builders can handle one project at a time. That's all the crew they have for them. Some, um, I think Phil has what, 25 projects going, or uh, you know, uh, total for. Or what, what's your total number of projects you you will have done um, this year? We'll probably be in the 50s. Okay, in, in the 50s. Okay, so they can handle multiple projects. Wow. Um, where and, and once in a while you meet a builder that's building you know tracks of homes. Hey, we can put up 150 homes, but you know there's. It really depends on your business plan and what you're trying to accomplish. Financing your new build. Real simply, your own personal cash. Obviously, that's number one. You got your own money. Our first house, we reached our pocket, we took out our money, and we paid for it. Okay? Matter of fact, that's how we're currently doing all of our builds. But there is hard money lending. Okay? If you run out of your own money, there's hard money lending. Hard money lending are people with cash who are willing to lend you money at a very high interest rate to build a new house. There are people that are sitting on a million dollars making 1% in the bank. They're much better off lending it to you. Most of these are on a one-year contract. It's considered a bridge loan. They'll usually charge you 8 to 12% interest. So they're gonna make a lot of money. But, uh, and they'll loan 50% of the build project. You have to come up with the other 50%. But if all you have is 50% and there's a nice profit at the end of it, it's a good idea. Don't be afraid of hard money. And then bank financing. There used to be no bank financing in new construction. It is creeping back in, okay? Not all banks do financing. You go down to Bank of America and say, I want to build a new house, they're probably going to say no. But Wells Fargo, probably, I would stay away from Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> stay away from Wells Fargo. They're going to jail. All right, they're going to jail, right. <laughs> um, so, some banks that do financing Sanibel Captiva Community Bank is one in our area. Yep. Preferred Community Bank is another one. What's the key word in these two banks? Community. 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 Wherever you're from, a community bank has a better chance of financing a, pro a new build than a regular bank. Why? Because they're vested in the, in the community. community. They want to see growth for the community. It's good for the community. So go to your community banks and ask them. But if it's Sanibel, you have to build in Sanibel, or? Well, here's another part. No, they'll, they'll do anywhere. Oh, okay. But they will only build with an approved builder. Oh, okay. With an appro Builders have been known to take a deposit and say, thank you for the money, and leave a project not even started in some cases. So these banks will only lend on approved builders that they have a relationship with, that they know, 
if they land on the property, the, 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 the construction is going to be from start to finish, and there's going to be a finished house when it's done. Byron, so, I went to say about Captiva. It's right here in Fort Myers. Oh, really? yeah. They said they'll land on new builds all over the U.S. Yeah. Wow. The Bank of Michigan moved down to Naples, Benita, mm -hmm. yeah. and... So the, name kind of, the name doesn't really do yeah, doesn't it, signify it, what they built. Yeah. So another question that you can ask the, cons the construction company is, did you lie on any of your answers? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> with, with the Bible, huh? Did All you right. lie on any of your answers? <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> contracts and draw schedules. Um, all builders have a builder's contract. This is an example of the Groff contract that uh, we, we currently have with, with Groff Construction. And it's going to lay out the A to Z of your construction along with a draw schedule. Um, this, a this particular one actually yeah. shows the draw schedule. And uh, the contract is filled with all kinds of stuff. This particular one, we highlighted a bunch of things to question. Read your contract. If there's things in there that you have a question about, highlight them and take them back to your builder. But this is about an eight-page contract that we have with Groff, which is a pretty standard contract. But read your contract because not all builders' contracts are the same. And some can really screw you, okay? Never ever sign a builder's contract with having it looked at by an attorney. I'm going to tell you, that I don't like attorneys. They're, they're a necessary evil, okay? Not all. Uh, <clears throat> what do you call a thousand attorneys at the bottom of the ocean? Good start. A good start, all right. Okay. Why don't sharks eat attorneys? Professional courtesy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. uh, but you have to have attorneys and you want an attorney to look at these contracts over. My recommended attorney is Kevin Jersinski, for those of you in the local area. Oh, David Kaufman, Kevin, in my Is he? Okay. <laughs> well, that's how the one they help us okay. right now. Right. How, do you, how do you spell that? Jersinski, J-U-R-S-I-N-S-K-I. Kevin gives yeah, speeches on what to look out for in new construction. He handles tons of new construction so contracts yeah. and is constantly in litigation over new construction cases that went bad. He's a little more expensive than anybody else out there, but he's worth every penny. I strongly recommend Kevin Jersinski to look over your contracts. Does well, David Kaufman is the one that helped us right now on, okay. on the last thing. Does he Great. just specialize in new construction law? No, no, no. He specializes in about six or seven different areas. But, but he is, Kevin Jersinski is a real estate attorney. Okay. Okay, there, there's, there's your general attorneys, there's your divorce attorneys, there's your He's bankruptcy attorneys. Attorney. He is a real estate attorney. David very, very Kaufman good. is a real estate attorney. And very Kaufman, David, David Kaufman. David Kaufman. All right, very good. David uh, draw Kaufman. schedule yes. might look like this, okay? Uh, set up like this shows six different draws, different levels of prices. The key is, is that when building a new house, you're not, if, if, if your contract's for 220000 bucks to build, you're not giving them $220,000. You're giving them payments along the way as each part of that build happens. So the return on your money is actually very, very good if you calculate the amount of money out of your pocket versus when, when you're completely out of pocket when you get it back. Who determines the, the amount? The builder, it's nego it, 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 the builder determines the amount with you. Each build has its own draw schedule. Each builder has their own draw schedule. They'll go over it with you and explain it to you. But keep in mind that all builds are done in draw schedules. Okay, let me... <coughs> does, the per does the client have to first be, if they're going to finance, Pre, get pre the lender is going to approve the draw schedule. Oh, the gonna say, lender, that's it. Okay. you're going to pay money down, and the lender is going to release funds to the builder per the draw schedule as the build happens and as they verify that the build has been completed. Mm -hmm. Is that right. part of the pre-approval process? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yes. Will local banks finance investments for new building? Well, that's a good question. Yes. Yes. The answer, the short oh, answer is yes. Some will. Some will. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, the spec sheet, the builder will give you a spec sheet. This is an a example of a spec sheet that's going to give you interior features, exterior features, and label everything out. Sometimes your spec sheets can be four pages long. Depends on what's in there. Okay. But just keep in mind that's another part of the building contract is a spec sheet. Common pitfalls. Understanding acquiring timely lien releases. This is huge. This is probably where people get in trouble. Uh, you're, you're financing a new build, you've paid the, uh, the next draw, and the builder, you're paying your draws, and the work's getting done, but you don't know if that builder is paying their subs. If the builder is not paying their subs, and you've paid that builder, and that builder leaves, 
you might still owe money on the house because that sub is going to put a lien on the house. As you build, you're going to receive paperwork in the mail where that builder is leaning the property. Or those subs are leaning the property. The roofer is going to lean the property. The concrete guy is going to lean the property. The trust guy is going to lean the property. And you want to get timely lien releases from your builder before giving them the next draw to show that that face has been paid in in full, signed off, and now it's okay to give them more money. Just keep in mind, this is the number one area that people that build get in trouble with their builders, which is why so, it's so important to use an approved builder. So I mean, we will, should ask for that? I mean, the, no, they, they will typically, your concrete, your big ticket items with your concrete, your trusses, there might be one or two other ones. They automatically, it doesn't matter if you paid it, they'll automatically send it as soon as the build starts. And the reason for that is because they are big ticket items, they don't want to get burned, and they just let you know that we already put a lien on it. And then the bank, or if you're doing cash, you just don't get the release of lien as soon as um, it's verified and everything. They just, it just, you're automatically gonna get it. So it scares some people sometimes when they're building, unless it goes to the bank, they won't even see it. But if they're um, doing cash, it gets sent to their house, and they're like, oh, oh no, I got a lien. So we let everybody know, listen, you're gonna get those. If the ones that worry are gonna be like, if you're, smaller subs or get putting liens on your own. Then you start to question, okay, like your electrician's putting liens on there, and then something's going on, you're not getting paid, they're not getting paid. But your big ticket items are automatically gonna hit. They're, no matter what, we we spoke with them, they're just gonna, there you go, we have to send them out, so. Is all this handled in a title company, in escrow? Yes. It is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when the contract's approved, the bank's approved it, then we pick a title company and open escrow? We, Typically, the builder will typically have an approved, obviously, title company oh, in which okay. um, they'll hold the money. They send an inspector out to okay. say, yes, concrete's been poured, release the next draw. Okay, so the title company really will be in charge of keeping Pretty track much. of those yeah. liens and the, the, Yeah, your, your banks and your title companies are not going to release money just right. because on most builders' work. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so the builder picks the title company. Correct. Okay. And yeah, the lien release, this is just an example of a lien release. It might look something like this. Very simple. Builder lien release. The underside builder in consideration. The amount or payment of blank hereby releases and waives its rights and claim for the labor services and the resources of material provided and furnished through date to date of the job site at such and such property. It could be something very simple like that. So these are just, just side, these are very important. Very important. Um, understanding the billing process. Terms, time, and trouble. Okay. We have all kinds of terms, okay, in, in building. And uh, time, and where can you get in trouble on time and trouble? Well, I want to have a little bit of fun with this. So, I have a, I have a warped sense of humor, all right? <coughs> so, here are some terms. What you might think and what we're gonna think. Number one, Phil. <laughs> or is it Phil? <laughs> okay. We're talking about this kind of fill, not this kind of fill. Secondly, slab. <laughs> now we're talking about this kind of slab. All right. How about carpet? <laughs> now we're talking about this kind of carpet. How about tub? No, our newest style tub. This is actually what we're putting in some of our houses right now. This is the newest style freestanding bathtub. The ladies love this, absolutely love this. It's deep. Yeah. Trust. <laughs> or trust, which is what we're talking Oops. about here. So, a couple of quick terms, or a couple of explanations. Here's an example of a footer and how it works. And we're going to be going out and looking at some in a few minutes. Um, different types of slab foundations. Floating slab, monolithic slab, support slab. You don't have to memorize this stuff, it's just good stuff to have. And again, all this will be on the video and I'll enlarge these on the video, yes. And usually, what is, what is it, which is the one that they usually use? Monolithic. Monolithic. Mono, mon, okay. We're in Florida, monolithic. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, here's an example of pouring a slab. Is that a monolithic slab? That's a monolithic okay. slab. It, yep. That means it's on the ground, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. But this is what it looks like when they're out there pouring. Whoops, excuse me. Did I break my TV? Um, here is what a wall looks like. Down here when we're building walls, they are reinforced concrete walls, and this is effectively how it shows the 
the footer, the foundation, and how the block goes in. And you fill in the, the block holes right there. Correct. Okay. And this is an example of the real life. This is what it looks like as they're putting up your walls and your houses down here. Sometimes you'll see dirt in here. They'll put the walls up first and then pour. Sometimes they'll, but uh, sometimes they'll pour the whole slab and then put the walls up. There's different styles of building. There's a wrong way to build. Everything is done per code. All right. Uh, this is your common roof, roof trust. This is known as your bottom cord, bearing points, top cord, king post, trust web. In case you want to know some of the terms of a truss. And this is commonly known as flying trusses. Hmm. You ever heard the term, well, we're flying your trusses today. Well, where the hell are you flying them to? <laughs> My house is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, they're flying trusses. means they're actually using a crane and bringing the trusses in and setting them. Uh, time and trouble inspections, calling in private. Inspections. How many times does a new, con new construction get inspected? Every time that they put like, Every time something happens. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there's probably about 30, 40 inspections in a, in a, in a, in a new in a construction. construction. <clears throat> so the funny part is when I'm selling new construction, the buyer goes, well, we got to hire a home inspector. Okay, fine, you can, but do you realize your home has been inspected 30 or 40 times already? Mm -hmm. You are probably wasting your time. Be my guest. And money. But, but the inspections in a new home inspection are so much deeper involved than any home inspector is ever going to go because they have to sign off on every phase of that new construction. So I can never tell, as a realtor, I can't tell them not to get a home inspection because I'm in trouble the minute I do that. Go ahead, have at it. But I do explain, listen, do you realize the home has been inspected 40 times already? You know, I just want them to know that. Um, also, there's county and private inspectors. When building a new house, your county comes off and signs off. The problem with that is what if that phase is completed, your walls are up, before you fly the trusses, they have to come out and sign off on it, and the county guy goes, well, I'm busy for two weeks, I can't get there for two weeks. Yeah. What does that do to your time to build? It's 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 exactly. So builders use private inspectors to come in. Now this costs extra money, they have to spend extra money. How much extra would you say you spend on a... On a Typically about $2,000. About $2,000. All right. All right, I'm gonna get that phone. So it doesn't interrupt us badly. Um, so that really? adds on a couple thousand bucks onto your bill, but you save that over the extended time. By using private inspectors, you might have saved six to eight weeks on that build time. So we strongly recommend using a builder that uses private inspectors for that reason. Builder's warranty, what does it cover and for how long? Well, <clears throat> first of all, there's about a thousand warranties on that house already. Your shingle company has a separate warranty on the shingles. Whoever they bought the hot water heater from has a particular warranty on that hot water. Um, you, you start thinking about all the different pieces of a new appliances. construction. Yeah, appliances, I mean, there, there's a thousand warranties. The guy that made the light bulb for the swimming pool, there's a warranty on that light bulb, okay? So there's all these other warranties that go with the new house. However, there's a blanket coverage that is a one-year builder's warranty. So. You want to talk to your builder about his one-year warranty and find out exactly what he covers during that one-year warranty. 